Good morning, everyone. God's son came to show the father's love that he has for this world lost in sin. Helping the hopeless, Jesus won the victory that we could not win. There is no greater love than his sacrificial death for you and me. If he so loved us, we us. Love each other just like Calvary. Gotta love each other like the Lord. Gotta love each other like the Lord. Yeah. Love, love, love. Love, love, love. Love. hope with life we could not cope the father's love gave us life and all that jesus won when we were dead once the spirit joined us to god's one and only son we're married to jesus our savior whose sacrificial death has set us free if he so loved us we Love each other just like Calvary Gotta love each other like the Lord And gotta love each other like the Lord Good morning once again, and if you could turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. As uh, we started on Sunday, we began the uh, study of the final major section of the body of 2 Thessalonians, which is contained in verses 6 through 15 of chapter 3. And so today we'll be, uh, at, on Sunday we actually went over, had an overview, sort of, uh, over uh, overview of these verses, and then we're going to start going verse by verse uh, through them now. Uh, today, uh, today we'll be looking at Second Thessalonians three six, and we'll also be looking at it uh, on um, on Thursday. Today we'll be looking at the passage itself, where, as you can see on the board, uh, it teaches us that the Thessalonians must disassociate themselves from those in their community who live an undisciplined life. Now, on Thursday, we'll use this verse as the jumping off point to talk about for the class uh, the subject of church discipline. So we'll be looking at that. We've studied it in the past; we had a series on it. We studied it when we did the series on apostasy last year. So a uh, very important subject. And uh, it, as, as and I've said this in the past, you don't really have a church if you don't practice church discipline. You really just have a social club. And so a uh, very important uh, subject. So that'll be our subject today, 2 Thessalonians 3.6. And as is our custom, we take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we're 
and fellowship with God because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit could cause us to lose fellowship with the Trinity. And we are restored to fellowship through the confession of sin according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. And He does that. The Father restores us to fellowship with Himself as a result of us confessing our sins to Him based upon the merits of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His death on the cross as well as our union identification with Him in that death. So uh, we maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. And if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, another day to study your almighty word. We thank you for those who might be joining us live or through the recordings at a later date. I thank you for each and every one of them that is a part of the members of the body of Christ and the future bride of Christ and your children through faith and regeneration. And we just thank you, Father, for each and every one of them. And also those who not, might not be yet a part of your, your community, not part of your people, not your children yet. Uh, we just thank you for them that are in the audience. And we also thank you for the technology and the te technology given to us and the people taking advantage of it. And I pray that the technology would function properly today uh, for the class. So there'd be no problems with the, the recordings, video, and the audio and upload of these things to our various websites and podcasts and media platforms that you've given to us. I pray you protect them, Father, from the evil one. Father, today, by the power of spirit, help me to communicate your word with regards to 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 so that, um, that the... the, the um, members of the body of Christ that are assembled, whether it's live or through the recordings, would receive their necessary spiritual nourishment. I pray you would help them to understand what's being taught, make application, enjoy what they're, they're being taught, and concentrate. Please break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up that would hinder that from happening. And I also pray, Father, that you would help the unbelievers in the audience to understand the gospel through the power of the Spirit, help them to uh, understand it so that they can make a decision to either accept us or reject your son Jesus Christ as Savior. We know that you desire all people to be uh, saved to come to experiential knowledge of the truth. So Father, we pray for the service in our great God and Savior Jesus Christ's name, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Okay, if you have not turned there, please do now. Second Thessalonians 3, 6. We'll be reading that from the uh, the Net Bible shortly. And, uh, and then we'll be looking at verse 6 in detail. As I said before the opening prayer, we'll be looking at verse 6 today. Uh, the passage itself, what's being said in the passage, which as we pointed out, uh, we, it, asserts, it asserts that the Thessalonians must disassociate themselves from those in their community who live an undisciplined lifestyle. And that is speaking of church discipline. On Thursday, we'll be looking at church discipline in de detail, but, but using 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15 as a jumping off point. And so uh, that'll, we'll be look, that's what we're looking at on Thursday. But today, again, we're looking at verse 6 and, and what it's saying, which is that the Thessalonians must disassociate themselves from those in their community who live an undisciplined lifestyle. So if you, uh, if you haven't turned again there, haven't turned there already, please again turn to 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 in your Bibles. I will be reading from the Net Bible, and I'm going to read the uh, verses 6 through 15, and we'll look at verse 6 in, in detail. So it says in verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, But we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from any brother who lives an undisciplined life and not according to the tradition they receive from us. For you, you, know, for you know yourselves how you must imitate us uh, because we did not behave without discipline among you and we did not eat anyone's food without paying. Instead, in toil and drudgery, we work night and day in order not to burden any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give ourselves as an example for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, neither should he eat. For we hear that some among you are living an undisciplined life, not doing their own work, but meddling in the work of others. Now, such people, we command and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and so provide their own food to eat. 
But you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing what is right. But if anyone does not obey our message through this letter, take note of them and do not associate closely with him so that he may be ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So as we've been pointing out, <clears throat> we studied on this on Sunday, that uh, it was a, not a majority, but a small minority in, second, uh, in the Thessalonian Christian community was disobeying Paul's apostolic command to work for a living and not be idle. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's echoing uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.11 and also 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Now, there's nothing in the contents of the first uh, Thessalonian letter that would indicate that the Thessalonians were guilty. Uh, anybody was guilty of not working and being idle. Uh, it appears that when, he got, when Timothy came back with the report uh, after coming back from Thessalonica, Thessalonica that he gave to Paul and Silvanus a report that some were indeed not working. And uh, so that's why he says what he says here in 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 6 through 15. Now, the reason why we pointed out there were several uh, 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 different interpretations as to why uh, some members of the Thessalonian Christian community were not working. And we went through those, Stephen Lewis, that we quoted from him, and uh, he, he gave us four big reasons why uh, th that interpreters uh, used to explain why some in the Thessalonian Christian community were not working. There's nothing in the contents of 2 Thessalonians or 1 Thessalonians for that matter which would indicate exactly the reason why. But as we pointed out, the, uh, I'm of the view and many others that the reason why they weren't working, it's a cultural thing. In other words, prior to becoming Christians, this was uh, the, uh, the lifestyle of many people uh, in the Roman Empire, in particular, that part of the Roman Empire, which was located in Greece, because the Greece had an aversion, uh, a, a, a disdain for manual labor. And so the Thessalonians were Greeks. Yes, they were in the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire had taken over the Greek Empire. So therefore, this is why Paul says what he says here uh, to the Thessalonians. That the, And so, uh, and of course, you got to remember in the Roman Empire, uh, slavery was a major institution, some estimates from 60 million and up. Uh, and it drove the economy. Uh, the, the economy would fall apart. Uh, the Roman economy would fall apart without the slave uh, labor. And so they, th therefore, that was another reason why people didn't uh, work because they had slaves to do the work and therefore it gave them a lot of free time. If you read anything about the Roman Empire and people wrote on it or some of the ancient uh, Roman historians, they'll t talk about this. So that's my, my take on why they were not working. It was a cultural thing. I remember the Thessalonians were Greeks and the Greeks had uh, a disdain for manual labor. Unlike the Jewish uh, culture, uh, the Jewish boys were all given a trade. Even Jesus had a trade, and Paul did too. His, his parents, his father was a tent maker as well as a rabbi, a Pharisee. And so he, uh, he learned a trade, and it was tent making. And when he went out through the Roman Empire and his missionary activities, he used that uh, particular uh, trade to support himself as a church planner, so he wouldn't burden any of the Christian communities that he had founded, though he did direct the pastors in those communities who he selected uh, to uh, be, receive remuneration for their service to the Christian community in these various churches that he had planted. So uh, if you could look on the board, uh, I have, uh, I want to look at uh, several translations of verse 6, if I could, uh, and uh, so we read the Net Bibles translation of 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Uh, the ESV translates this verse, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not accord with the tradition that you receive from us. The Lexham Bible, another excellent translation, But we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who lives irresponsibly and not according to the tradition they receive from us. All great translations. Today's NIV. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received us uh, received from us. Uh, the Good News Bible, our brothers and si sisters, we command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to keep away from all believers who are living a lazy life and do not follow the instructions that we gave them. And then I'll give you my translation. Now we command each and every one of you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to disassociate yourself from any brother or sister who is living an undisciplined lifestyle. Consequently, they're not living according to the traditions which they received from each one of us. So in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, Paul 
as we can see from my translation and the other modern translations, he's issuing a command to each member of the Thessalonian Christian community regarding their relationship to those in their community who are unrepentantly disobedient to his spirit-inspired teaching, which required them to all work for a living and not be idle. Uh, there was Remember in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's echoing this verse, and command is echoing, is, is alluding to a problem that was happening in the Thessalonian Christian community, namely the people, namely the people were not working for a living, but being busybodies. And Paul talked to them about this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Uh, if you look at my translation on the board of um, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, look at verse 9 on the board. My translation. Now, concerning the topic of Christian love, each and every one of you possesses absolutely no need whatsoever for any one of us to write to any one of you at this particular time because each one of you, each of yourselves, are taught by God for the purpose of making it your habit of divinely loving one another. For indeed, each and every one of you are making it your habit of practicing it for the benefit of your spiritual brothers and sisters located throughout Macedonia. However, each one of us are authoritatively exhorting and encouraging each one of you, brothers and sisters, to make it your habit of excelling more and more. So he's talking in the context of Christian love. Then he says in verse 11, also, for your own benefit, to make it your habit, to make it your habit of making it your ambition to live a quiet life, and he tells you what this is, he describes it, of attending to your own business, not being a busybody, of working to support yourselves with your own hands as each and every one of us has commanded each and every one of you. Then he says, the purpose of which is for each one of you to make it your habit of living properly while interacting with those who are outsiders, the non-believers, as well as for each of you to possess absolutely no need whatsoever. So there's two reasons why he gives there why they should be working for a living and not being idle, uh, busybodies. Uh, one, it's to not be a burden to the Christian community uh, and uh, financially. And secondly, to be a good uh, testimony to the non-Christian community. And so there was no evidence in First Thessalonians that they were guilty of this. Uh, it's just, it, 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 but we know from the contents of Second Thessalonians that Timothy brought back a report, as we mentioned before, to Paul and Sylvanus, and it was a, apparent that they were, some of them, were guilty of not working for a living and were disobeying Paul's apostolic teaching. And why? Because they were going reverting back to their pre-conversion days because the Thessalonians who were Greek, uh, immersed in Greek thought and culture and religion, uh, they were following the, the culture and, and the, and that they were immersed in, which was many were not working and they had a, uh, they had a great uh, uh, disdain for manual labor. So then let's look at First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's, let's look at verse 14. First Thessalonians 5.14, Now each one of us is authoritatively exhorting and encouraging each and every one of you, brothers and sisters, to make it your habit of pro pro providing the undisciplined with instruction and continue doing so. So there he's anticipating that some are going to uh, do this, that are going to be um, uh, not working. So he, there, that's a preventative maintenance right there. Then it says in verse, the rest of the verse says, each of you make, begin to make it your habit of encouraging the discouraged and continue doing so. Each one of you continue to make it your habit of helping the weak. Each one of you must continue to make it your habit of being patient toward everyone. But again, notice he wants the them to uh, provide instruction for the undisciplined. And remember, the undisciplined are those who were not working. Now, the, again, I can't st stress this enough. There's nothing in the contents which think which uh, would allude to the fact that they would some were guilty. Uh, it appears that he's using preventative maintenance here. And how do I know that? Because if you look at the contents of 1 Thessalonians, he commends them for their faith in practicing the command of love. He commands he commends all of them. Now, uh, so therefore, when he says this, this would have to, I would think, indicate uh, that there was, he was anticipating some of them falling back into their pre-conversion lifestyle. So let's go back now to 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 3, verse 6. And again, my translation of the verse goes as follows. Now we command each and every one of you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to disassociate yourselves from any brother or sister who is living an undisciplined lifestyle. Consequently, they are not living according to the traditions which they receive from each one of us. So again, for 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, we have Paul issuing a command to 
each member of the Christian community in Thessalonica regarding their relationship to those in their community who were unrepentantly disobedient to his spirit-inspired teaching, which required them all to work for a living and not be idle. Now, this command required that each of them disassociate themselves from any brother or sister who is living an undisciplined lifestyle. In other words, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were communicating and writing to each member of this community the command to practice church discipline with those who rejected their apostolic teaching, which required that they work and not be an, not be an idol. Now, uh, as we pointed out briefly on Sunday, uh, he's really talking about the men. Because in, in back in the first century, the women kept the home. Uh, it's not to say there were not um, exceptions to the rule. The general rule was that women were in the home, raising families. It's not like American culture today, where both uh, men and women are working. They're out in the workplace. And so, but that was not the case in the first century. So it would be the men who would be idle. That would uh, be, be uh, that would be uh, a guilty here. So uh, the, now it's interesting. The verb paraangelo in Second Thessalonians three six. This word means to command, to order, because the word pertains to giving instructions or to direct somebody with authority to do something. If you look at the the Net Bible, it says in verse six, we command. Now, the word paraangelo, okay, that's the verb there, uh, which is translated command correctly. We command. This verb means the command to order, so it's correctly translation by, translated by the modern translations, of course, uh, great translations. And the reason why is that this word pertains to giving instructions to or directing somebody with authority to do something. So, therefore, this verb, paraangelo, is expressing the idea that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were communicating and writing to each member of the Thessalonian Christian community, the command to keep away from those in their community who were living an undisciplined life, which is not according to the teaching they received from these three men. In other words, it is expressing the idea that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were communicating and writing to each member of the Thessalonian Christian community the command to practice church discipline with those who rejected their apostolic teaching, which required that they work and not be idle. And so uh, when he says to disassociate yourself with them, that's after, as we'll see a little later, and we saw this on Sunday, that's after they've gone through the three stages of church discipline mapped out by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And so after the third stage, if they didn't repent the guilty party, then the Christian community was to disassociate themselves with that individual until they did repent. And of course, as we pointed out, at the end of this, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, uh, we should always leave room uh, open for repentance and we're instructing them, reaching out to them. But if they still don't repent, then you must continue to disassociate yourself with these individuals that are rejecting uh, the apostolic teaching. Now, notice that uh, Paul, uh, this the contents of First and Second Thessalonians and all Paul's letters and the apostles' letters, uh, took the place of their not being present with them. So they carried, their spirit inspired these letters and they carried the authority of the apostles in Jesus and they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. So uh, Paul is, uh, this letter, 2 Thessalonians, and this command is taking the place of them giving this command in their presence. Now, interestingly, the, uh, Paul employs this, uh, the, uh, uh, the verb paraangelo, I have a typo in my notes there, sorry about that, uh, Paul employs the, the verb paraangelo rather than the verb parakaleo, which we've seen many times in our study of First and Second Thessalonians. We've seen this parakaleo in First Thessalonians 2, 12, 3, 2, 7, and 4, 1, 10, and 18, 5, 11, 14, as well as Second Thessalonians 2, 17, and we'll see it again in Second Thessalonians uh, 3, 12, and you'll see it in Second Thessalonians 3, 10. We've also saw... Uh, Excuse me, Parangelo, we saw that. Uh, we saw uh, in, in 2 Thessalonians uh, 3.10 and 3.12 uh, 3, and 3.4. But uh, Parakaleo, it only appears in 2 Thessalonians 2.17 and 3.12. And this verse, uh, and not in this verse, in 2 Thessalonians 3.6, because Paul's choosing Parangelo instead. So here in 2 Thessalonians 3.6, he employs this verb Parangelo rather than Parakaleo because he wants to emphasize the importance of administering church discipline to these individuals in the Thessalonian Christian community who are disobeying his teaching to work and not be idle. 
uh, a great scholar, a great commentator on First and Second Thessalonians, who I highly recommend, Jeffrey Weimer, and I believe that's how you pronounce his last name, or it could be Weimer, I can't remember which, I believe it's Weimer. But T he has the following quote about Paul's choice of the, the uh, paraangelo, uh, rather than parakaleo, and I'm just looking at, uh, I don't know why I keep putting noun there in my notes, I have to catch that there, I say, keep saying the noun paraangelo, it's the verb. So he uses parakaleo here, I doesn't use paracletal here, I use para and gelo, Paul does, and here's Jeffrey Weimer's uh, comment on this, and I'm quoting, he says, on the one hand, this change is surprising, given, given Paul's clear preference for the softer, more user-friendly verb, paracletal, appeal. Fee, therefore, another great commentator and scholar, notes that the command itself is especially unusual for Paul, and thus quite unexpected, and a quote by Fee. On the other hand, Weimer goes on to say, this change is entirely understandable in light of two considerations. First, the apostles' foreshadowing comments in verse 4, what things we are commanding you indeed are doing and will continue to do, prepare the reader for Paul's command here and in and, and, uh, and, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, he says. Secondly, he says, this is now the third time that the apostle has needed to stress the problem of idleness. First time in Paul's missionary visit, 1 Thessalonians 4.11 we noted, and 2 Thessalonians 3.6 and 10. The second time in previous is Paul's previous letter, 1 Thessalonians 4.11 and 5.14. And that, and that the problem, he says, has grown worse instead of better justifiably requires Paul to shift from the softer appeal in his earlier letter to the stronger command here. So he believes there was also, at, 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 the, at the time of writing 1 Thessalonians, that's some were uh, guilty of this. I, I don't believe that there was, but he's he thinks that there was, and he's he's a good scholar, so he could be right. And uh, so, uh, so therefore, he, I believe, so he says right here, he uses paraangelo here in verse 6 of 2 Thessalonians 3, because there's a problem now, and he's so, he, so he's saying the problem is intensified. I say he's using this verb paraangelo, uh, rather than parakaleo here, is because now there actually are people who are guilty of not working and being idle. That's why I believe he's doing doing this. So, uh, in fact, he mentions this other thing, and we pointed this out in our study of, of 2 Thessalonians 3, 4. If you look at 2 Thessalonians 3, 4 on the board, see the verb paraangelo? It's right here. In second, on, I'm showing the Greek text, Nestle Island text uh, 28. And uh, paraangelo is right here. And, and we see it in first. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 4, the Net Bible, they translate the verse verse 4, and we are confident about you in the Lord that you're both doing and will do what we are commanding. As we pointed out, what we are commanding, paraangelo, which I just pointed out to you in the Greek text, appears in verse 4, and that indicates what, when he says what we're commanding, he's speaking of the commands. He's issuing in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15. How do we know that? Because this word paraangelo, appearing in verse 4, is foreshadowing uh, its use in verses 6 and verses 10 and verses 12, okay? And the command is to work. So you see parangelo, if I show you on the Greek text on the board for those who are interested, it's in verse 4. It's foreshadowing its, foreshadowing its use in verses 6 through 15. It appears in verse 6 as we see, and it's also appearing uh, in, uh, in verse 10. There it is, parangelo men. And then we have, that's in the first person plural, um, uh, imperfect, imperfect active indicative form, conjugation. And then we have it in verse 12, parangelo men. And right there, it's uh, in the present active uh, indicative, first person uh, plural conjugation form of the verb parangelo. So this is very indicate, uh, this is indicating that Paul is emphasizing the command here. Again, as my point on the board, Paul employs parangelo uh, rather than Parakaleo, the milder word, as Weimer puts up, points out, he's using it here in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, rather than parakaleo, because he wants to emphasize the importance of administering church discipline uh, among these individuals who are disobeying his teaching to work and not be idle. Now, Paul, uh, he addresses each member of the Thessalonian Christian community with the masculine plural form of the noun adelphos, which, as we pointed out many times, means spiritual brothers and sisters. Uh, there's a case, you could say, in, in verses 6 through, um, the rest of the, 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 the passage, uh, verses 7 through 15, that you can translate it as brothers, because they're the ones, the men will be ones working, the women were at home, working in the home, taking care of the kids and do, taking care of the home. So uh, Paul, 
uh, he not only addresses each and every member of this community in Thessalonica with this word, Adelphos, but also those in this community who were unrepentantly disobedient to Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy's spirit-inspired teaching, which required, again, for all of them to work for a living rather than be idle. And so that's telling you, uh, it, 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 it's, if, you look at, uh, if you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter um, th- uh, 3, verse 12, now such people, we command, those who are not working, we command and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and so provide their own food to eat. But you, brothers and sisters, those who are obedient, do not grow weary in doing what is right. But if anyone does not obey our message through this letter, take note of him and do not associate closely with him that so that he may be ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And that's Adelphos. So there, uh, this is talking about the equality of the, the those members of the Christian community, whether you're in apostasy or you're uh, obedient and having fellowship with God, you're still a brother and sisters in, sister in Christ, even though you're living in sin. Very important. So you're not lost yourself. They haven't lost their salvation, but they have lost their fellowship, not only with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but those who are obedient to Paul's teaching, Spirit-inspired teaching. They're losing fellowship, but they're not their eternal relationship with the, uh, each other is not severed. So we got to keep this in mind that when we do practice church discipline, it's a brother or sister in Christ. Paul reiterates that. Don't, don't, you're not running them off. You're not pushing them out of the church. We're unbiblical reasons. You shouldn't be doing that. Though we know it's happened in the past, we shouldn't be doing that. There are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all equal before the cross. We were all saved on the merits of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And, and, and nobody, nobody is better than the other. Okay, so this word Adelphos emphasizes the equality of those sinners declared justified through faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. You know, Galatians 3, 26 and 28. Of course, that's not popping up for me. <laughs> Can't have everything, right? Galatians 3, 26 and, uh, through 28 in the NIV. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are, bap- who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ, your union identification with him. There's neither new, Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one, or we could say equal, in Christ Jesus. So this word, Adelphos, which appears uh, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, is functioning as what we call in Greek grammar, a vocative or nominative of simple address. And this means it's expressing the fact that these three men, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, are issuing a solemn, quote-unquote, and extremely important command here in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. So the fact that this word is evocative of simple address in Greek grammar, it's telling you, he's addressing them, uh, Paul is addressing each member of the Thessalonian Christian community with this term, Adelphos, brothers and sisters, meaning your spiritual brothers and sisters through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Now, but the fact that he's doing that uh, is, uh, and he's putting in the vocative of simple address, that's telling us that this command that's in verse 6, is very solemn. That's why he's putting this word in the vocative, as a vocative of simple address. So Paul, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, employs the prepositional phrase, and, on, where is it here in the Greek here? Okay, there it is in the Greek, and this is the transliteration here on the board, and this particular expression in the Greek, onomati tu kyrio hemon Jesu Christu, which is translated in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Net Bible in most of the translations. This prepositional phrase uh, is modifying the verb stello, which expresses the idea of disassociating yourself from someone. It actually presents the means by which Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy are issuing this command to each member of this Thess- a Christian community in Thessalonica here in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. So this verb stello is expressing the idea that these three men issued this command to each member of this community in Thessalonica by means of the name, or we could say the authority, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we use the word name there, he's speaking of its authority. This word onoma uh, onoma, uh, is actually a a name. It has a very very, um, uh, interesting connotation to it, attached to it. So we'll look at that in a moment. We looked at it in the past. But here it's emphasizing, when it says the name, it's emphasizing the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this interpretation of this prepositional phrase, uh, en, 
onomati to Creorio Hemon Iesu Christu by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 6 is supported by 1 Thessalonians 4 2. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4 1 and 2 in my translation, therefore, in addition to this, brothers and sisters, each one of us is requesting, yes, urgently, authoritatively, encouraging each and every one of you on the basis of the Lord Jesus Christ's commands that each one of you receive from us instruction how each of you are obligated to make it your habit to live in a manner so as to make it your habit of pleasing God as each one of you are in fact making your habit of living that each of you make it your habit of excelling more and more then he says for each and every one of you are well aware of what type of commands that each one of us gave to each one of you by means of the authority of the Lord Jesus so Paul's use the word onoma there in 1 Thessalonians 4 2 uh, supports, and what he says there in verse 2, support, in verse 1 as well, 1 Thessalonians 4, supports the interpretation that this particular prepositional phrase, en onomati, to curio hemon Jesu Christu, which I translate by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in 2 Thessalonians 3 6, that interpretation, that translation is supported uh, by the contents of 1 Thessalonians 4 1 and 2. So the word onoma, name in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 ha, has a five-fold sense. And this is why I want to talk about it a little bit here. This word onoma, it can signify different things about the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we think of the word the name, okay, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it signifies different things. It has like a five-fold sense in scripture. Uh, first of all, the first uh, uh, thing it signifies is the personality of the Lord Jesus Christ, distinguishing him from the heathen gods. Number two, it signifies the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, representing who he is as the unique theanthropic person of history, the God-man. Number three, it also signifies the Lord's work in creation and for the salvation of sinful humanity through his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father. Number four, it also, this word on my name, it uh, uh, signifies the reputation of the Lord Jesus before the human race as the creator and redeemer of the human race. And then lastly, the, the last signification is this. It signifies the authority of the Lord Jesus over the church and over every human being, angel, and all of creation as a result of being the creator. So however, here in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, this word name is emphasizing the authority. It's emphasizing the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy are issuing the Thessalonians a spirit-inspired command to practice church discipline with those among their community who are disobeying their spirit-inspired command to work and not be idle. So the word name there is emphasizing the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are speaking from the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul was personally selected to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Timothy and uh, uh, Silvanus uh, were pastors. That was ordained by the, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, he gave gifts to men, Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. He chose some to be apostles, uh, evangelists. You remember that passage there, pastors and teachers, uh, prophets, pastors and teachers, the last one. And he's the one who selected that. And the Holy Spirit, he delegated the authority of the Holy Spirit to give these men in the Christian community throughout the church age these gifts these communication gifts. So there's the, the uh, they, they have this authority. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy had this authority given to them by the Lord Jesus Christ. And every pastor and a, an evangelist has this authority given to him as well because they were given the gift by the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he used the Holy Spirit to uh, bring that about at our justification. And so therefore we have that authority. But listen to me very carefully, and it's with a caveat. There are a lot of passages, a, a pastor or an evangelist, the minute they deviate from what the Holy Spirit is speaking in the scriptures, the word of God, the mind of Christ, and which reveals the Father's will, the minute we deviate from scripture, we're not operating in that authority. And as that's to me very carefully, and I've seen this in the Christian community, my wing of Christianity over the, over the last 30 years. If your pastor is not, if the pastor is teaching, he's teaching the word of God, okay? But if he's if he doesn't give you chapter, he needs to give you chapter and verse. He needs to explain why his interpretation. 
because there are a lot of guys who are asserting things that the Bible says they don't have support biblically. So it, just because somebody is saying something from the pulpit, that doesn't mean you have to obey it. You have to, you obey it when you have the conviction that this is what the Spirit is speaking through the Scriptures. You have the Holy Spirit, you're to test the spirits. 1 John 4, 1-6 through as we pointed out. So I've said this many times, you don't believe me just and just blindly believe me, whatever I say. I have to have support biblically. That's why I explain what I say. I explain my translations. I explain my interpretations in great detail in written form and doing these broadcasts. So it's very important. So don't just believe what I say for the sake of, because Bill said so. And I've seen people out of, uh, or ridiculously blindly obeying pastors, what they teach, and they shouldn't because they, they're, what they're teaching them is false. It's not supported by scripture. But these people, because they like the pastor or they, because they into the personality cult that I've, I've been pointing out over the years, uh, the, there's too much of this personality cult thing where they blindly, it's like like when I was in the Roman Catholic Church, people just believed whatever the Pope and the Cardinal, Cardinal uh, College of Cardinals said and the priest said, and uh, even if it wasn't in the scripture. Well, I'm not going to believe it. I don't, you know, I don't expect you or anybody to believe anything I say if it's not supported by Scripture. And some people are just blindly obeying what a pastor says and looking the other way, even though what he has to say, his interpretation, is not correct. So with pastors, it's don't ever, you know, I I never minded anybody ever, you know, who doesn't agree with my trans my interpretation. Part of the problem I have with people is those who disagree with me is the manner in which they disagree with me. You know, don't be a jerk. Don't be mean. Don't treat me the way you wouldn't want to be treated, okay? So if you disagree with me, that's fine. But don't do it in a manner that's disrespectful, okay? So that's what, when you approach your pastor and disagree with him some, on something, okay, but make sure the manner in which you're doing it is respectful to him. Not just because he's a pastor, but he's a fellow believer in Christ, okay? Now, the other thing is, so when, the, when it, you know, just the, when you go and approach him, you know, you, what is your interpretation? And what are your reasons why not to accept your pastor's interpretation? You need to get your nose in the scriptures, in other words. So you can say, I don't agree with him. He could be right, but you don't disagree. You're disagreeing with him. Why? What's your reason for disagreeing with him? So you got to use your brain. You got to get your nose in the scriptures. Everybody in the Christian community gets, the, it needs to get their nose in the Bible. Okay. That's where the pastor's authority resides. The minute he steps out of that, out of what the Word of God says and comes up with his own little things, he's not speaking from the authority of God. And that's the Pharisees. They were guilty of this. They were not uh, supporting, they were not, what they, a lot of those things that they were saying was not supported by Scripture. It was from their own uh, imaginations. And therefore, they were not speaking from God. Very important. So Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy, by using this word name, onoma, uh, onoma, it name it's speaking of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're issuing this command to disassociate from any disobedient, unrepentant, disobedient individual in their community that was not working and uh, and being idle in disobedience to their apostolic command, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit and originated from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the verb stello, to, which uh, the the Net Bible, they translate this word stello to keep away. Okay, there it is, to keep away. Uh, I translate it to disassociate yourselves. Um, if you look at my translation, to disassociate yourselves. That's how I translate it. And so this particular word, stello, here in verse 6 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, pertains again to staying clear from someone and not associating with them in any way or to purposely to avoiding, avoiding association with someone. And it's used in relation to the administration of, of church discipline. Again, I repeat, this verb stello, to keep away from, uh, or as I say, to disassociate yourselves, pertains to staying clear from someone and not associating with them in any way to purposely avoid associating with that someone. And it's used in relation to the administration of church discipline. Specifically, it refers to the Thessalonians practicing the final stage of church discipline with regards to those in their community who were unrepentantly disobedient to Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy's spirit-inspired command to work for a living and not be idle. Now, notice the way, that definition there, okay? I was, I remember one time when I was, there was a certain individual, they weren't a part of my church. There was another pastor. And this pastor was, um, it was 
was uh, unrepentantly doing things that were very bad for the Christian community. Immoral, more immoral acts, drunkenness, and was not repentant of it. Nobody was holding this person accountable. And I stayed away from that person. And I was criticized by this church because I wouldn't associate with this pastor. I did the right thing. I loved him. Uh, because if I, I'm not a, I'm not sitting there condone by sitting there or having any kind of association with him when he's doing these things unrepentantly, uh, it I'm not I'm not doing that I'm not I'm not looking out for his best interests. See, there were there, people in his church were le- getting let him not holding him accountable and it was hurting the man. They didn't love him. Some did, and of course he the pastor pushed them away, and that's what he did. But this very very serious problem. So. Um, you know, somebody, you know, like for instance, you know, remember Joseph, Joseph's brothers try, try to kill him. Remember that in the book of Genesis, Joseph's brothers try to kill him. Finally, one of them said, no, we'll just sell him into slavery to the Midianites. And they did. And so he ends up, of course, in Pharaoh's court and he becomes the prime minister as we know the story. So he, here he is, the prime minister of Egypt, only Pharaoh's above him, and Joseph finds his brothers coming into town looking for food because of the famine was throughout the world. And he was dressed as an Egyptian, didn't look like them, like the, uh, the, his brothers anymore. And he was speaking Egyptian, and he hid his identity from them. Why? Okay, because he wanted to see, and that's where all those tests were, he wanted to see if his brothers had repented from what they did to him after 20 years. And so he was not going to reveal his identity to them until they, he was sure that those, that person, uh, that they were, had repented from what they did to him. And he determined that they had repented from what they did to him. That's called discernment. Love must have discernment. Paul says this, he prayed for this for the Philippians in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. So we need to have discernment when we're practicing church discipline. And it should not be, the whole Christian community is involved, but people who don't know their Bible, they need to watch others who know their Bible when it comes to practicing church discipline because you can do a lot of damage to people and hurt the testimony of the church by not practicing it the right way. So this final stage of church discipline required the Thessalonians to not have any association with a member of their community who is stubbornly unrepentant and disobeying this command to work after having gone through the three stages of church discipline mapped out by the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And this interpretation is indicated by the fact that the final stage of church discipline as taught by the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples in Matthew 18, 15 through 17 requires that the church disassociate themselves from an unrepentant member of their community after going through the three stages of church discipline. And the fourth and final stage is excommunication. Look at Matthew. We looked at this on Sunday. But look at Matthew 18, 15, please. On the board. Matthew 18, chapter 18, look at verse 15. I'm reading from the NIV. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. That's just between the two of you. Compare that with Galatians 6. One, as we pointed out, you're to do this with gentleness. Gentleness. Treat them the way you'd want to be treated. And look into yourselves, Paul says, because you might be on the other end next time. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Meaning, If they've repented and stopped what they're doing and are obeying God, then you've won them over, you should have fellowship with them. That's the first stage. Here's the second, verse 16. But if they will not listen, meaning they won't respond and be held accountable, take one or two others along, that means witnesses to what they've done, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If you don't have the witnesses, it, there's nothing more you can do. And you're not to receive the act, uh, you're not to receive as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.19 in the context of elders, pastors, uh, you're not to receive an accusation against someone unless you have two or more witnesses. So that would clear up a lot of problems in our churches if we stop take, uh, just accepting accusations with no witnesses to support the accusation. So that's the second stage we see in verse 16. Here's the third and verse 17. If they still refuse to listen, Tell it to the church. Bring it to the entire Christian community that you belong to. And if they refuse to listen, refuse to be held accountable, 
even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. As I pointed out on Sunday, it, which he's talking to Jewish believers, Jesus said. It's, it, we're going to remember that in context. So it's in the context of the Jewish community. Yeah, they're believers, but they're Jews. And they had nothing to do with Gentiles. As we pointed out in Acts chapter 10, the Lord needed to give Peter a vision three times that it was okay for him to go in with Gentile home, Cornelius. So he'd give him the gospel. The tax collectors were ostracized by the Jews because Jewish tax collectors, they considered as traitors. They were collecting taxes for the Romans who were an occupying country, okay, occupying their country. So therefore, he said, have nothing to do with them. Now, as I pointed out in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, if you look that real closely, look at... Uh, he says in verse 14, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Then look what he says. Yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. So, okay, so they so they go through, they're unrepentant, and they go through the three stages of church discipline. You have to excommunicate them. But he says, don't, don't treat them as an enemy. They're your brother and sister in Christ, remember? Adelphos. You have to warn them as a fellow believer. That's what you should do. So you leave room open for repentance, meaning you don't have, it's not like you have absolutely no contact. You have you don't have them in the fellowship of your meetings. And if you do talk to them, it's to confront them again about their sin and, and, and instruct them and, and, and love and gentleness that they repent. And if they still don't, then you have nothing to do with them. So we always got to leave room open for repentance. So what the Lord says in Matthew 18, 15 through 17 is not the whole story on church discipline. There's other passages. Uh, First, that's First Corinthians 5, we talked about on Sunday. We used that, talked about that. Second Thessalonians 2, chapter 2 is another one. Romans 16 uh, re refers to it. First uh, Timothy chapter 5, where the elders talks about it. So very important subject that we, we uh, John, uh, the third John, the, the, John's third letter, we studied that. Uh, the, the church discipline, Second John, talks about church discipline in those passages as well. So, very important subject. And so, uh, you can go back now to Second Thessalonians three six. So. If you look at uh, the Net Bible's translation of 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, but we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from any brother who lives an undisciplined life. Okay? Now, the prepositional phrase, which is translating this from any brother who lives an undisciplined life, that's translating the, Gre the Greek prepositional phrase apo, pantos, adelphu, ataktos, uh, peri, patuntas which I translate from any brother or sister who is living an undisciplined lifestyle. So this particular prepositional phrase is also modifying the verb stello, to keep away from, and it's expressing the idea of each member of this community in Thessalonica separating from or disassociating themselves from any member of their community who unrepentantly rejects Paul's apostolic teaching to work and not be idle. Now the purpose of this excommunication of this unrepentant member of the Thessalonian Christian community was to get them to repent, which would involve confession of sin followed by obedience to Paul's apostolic teaching. So uh, we, we need to understand something. When I talk about unrepentant with regards to the Christian community, I mean, they're refusing to confess their sins. And you know that by the way their behavior is. Those who obey sound doctrine, their, their, their conduct, their behavior reflects sound doctrine in their soul that they're applying it because it'll reflect in their godly behavior. Godly doctrine, or do, sound doctrine, Bible doctrine, inspired by the Holy Spirit and Scripture, when we obey it, will produce godly behavior in our lives. False doctrine or rejecting sound doctrine will produce ungodly behavior ungodly behavior. So, the practice of this discipline, people, was to protect the testimony of the Christian community in relation to the non-Christian community. Okay, so our testimony is at stake here. We can't have our pastors or members of our congregation running around having, uh, living a lifestyle 
of fornicating, adulterous affairs, drug abuse, alcoholism, uh, we can't, slandering people, uh, blatant idolatry, uh, materialistic. We can't, we're hurting our testimony if we're just like the, the non-Christian community who's guilty of these things. We need to be distinct from them and that our, our standards and our behavior are godly. And we can't have that happen if we're not obeying God's word. We need to learn and obey it. Now here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, the verb peripateo, if you look at the net Bible, this word is translated who lives. And I believe, um, let's see here, peripateo, here it is, yeah, it's in the participle form, peripatuntos, as I pointed out earlier. And this particular word peripateo, it's in the uh, present active uh, participle not, uh, masculine singular genitive conjugation. Okay, so this verb peripateo, translated who lives by the net Bible, good translation. And a lot of times you'll see it translated walk. It means walk, but you can, tr it's a, a, a dynamic equivalence translation would be, we would understand it to be speaking of living your life, a lifestyle. So this verb peripateo is modified by the adverb of manner ataktos, which we pointed out on Sunday. Now this word pertains to not submitting to discipline and order, and it's related to the adjective ataktos, which appears in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, as we noted on Sunday, and this adjective means those who are undisciplined, because the word pertains to not submitting to discipline and order. So therefore, in 2 Thessalonians 3.6, this adverb of manner, ataktos, means undisciplined, because it, the word pertains to not submitting to discipline and order. It's a military term, as we pointed out. You're, you know, you're out of, you're, you're the, the, so in the military, you had to follow orders. There was a certain uh, code of conduct in the military, how you're supposed to take, so, uh, carry yourself. And, and, and so this word says, these people were not obeying Paul's apostolic teaching to work, but were being idle instead. Uh, they're out of line. They're not walking uh, as, they're not good soldiers here. They're, they're being disobedient. They're out of order and they need to be dealt with. So he's using a strong word here when he uses this word ataktos in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, which um, the Net Bible, uh, they, they translate this word undisciplined, which is a great translation. That's what you should translate it as. So therefore, this particular word uh, speaks of a member of the Thessalonian Christian community living an undisciplined lifestyle, which is identified in 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 through 15 as not working and being idle, which Paul says, here in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, is in defiance of his apostolic teaching. Thus, this word, ataktos, undisciplined, speaks of a member of the Thessalonian Christian community living an undisciplined lifestyle as a result of rejecting Paul's teaching for each member of this community to work and not be idle. And again, this is a great application, as we pointed out Sunday, for the Christian community, especially in America and around the world. In America, we have a big problem now with people not wanting to work. They're quitting their jobs at record numbers. And I don't know where, they must get their money from Bitcoin or so. They're making a killing somewhere in the market. I don't know where they, how are they paying their rent and paying their homes, uh, a mortgage, uh, you know, probably because they're uh, getting, uh, uh, they're getting uh, unemployment from the government. And uh, so uh, this is a serious problem going on in the country. Don't be one of those people that is able to work and doesn't refuses to work. As a Christian, as a Christian, if you're able to work, you need to get to work. That's what this passage is, the application for this passage. If you have, or you're able, you're not disabled, you have no health issues that are going to keep you from working. If you're able to work, you should be working as a Christian. That's what the Bible says. So get back to work if you're guilty. I didn't say that. This passage, the Holy Spirit said this through Paul. So though this letter and this, this command in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 was given to the, a Christian community in Thessalonica 2,000 years ago, Though it wasn't to us directly, it has application. Why? Because we're in the same boat as the Thessalonian Christian community and that we're in union with Christ through faith alone and Jesus Christ alone. And Jesus said, through the Spirit and Paul's teaching in first, uh, first and Second Thessalonians, that we're to work for a living if we're able. Again, if you're disabled, 
the same talking to you. Though I think some people who are disabled can still work, and, and some are, I know. They can still do things, even though they might be confined to a wheelchair. Uh, nowadays, with the technology, you can still work. It doesn't mean just because you're disabled doesn't mean you might not be able to do manual labor, but you'll still be able to do other things, get in front of a computer. You have this pretty cool technology that we have. And I know some guys who are uh, confined to a wheelchair and paralyzed from the neck down, and they're still working, doing stuff. And uh, with the technology, uh, computer technology that we have. So, very important application that we have here in 2 Thessalonians 3 6. Now, as we come into the end here of our study of 2 Thessalonians 3 6 today, and thank you for joining us. <clears throat> here in uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 6, as I pointed out, this uh, verse is composed of a command, which we noted today, required that each member of the Christian community in Thessalonica disassociate themselves from any brother or sister who is living an undisciplined lifestyle. It also is followed, this command is followed by a result clause, which presents the result of these disobedient members of the community living an undisciplined lifestyle. It asserts, this result clause asserts, that they were not living according to the traditions which they received from Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. If you look at the Net Bible, <clears throat> excuse me, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 says, by, but we command you, Brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from any brother who is living an undisciplined life. And here's the result clause. And not according to the tradition they receive from us. Uh, I translate that expression there. Uh, Consequently, they are not living according to the traditions which they receive from each one of us. Now, the word consequently is translating uh, the uh, conjunction chi in the Greek text. And I believe it's a marker of result because if you look at the what it introduces, if you look in the uh, the Net Bible again, not according to the tradition they receive from us, that statement there is, if you compare it with the previous one, indicates that there's a res this particular ex a phrase, and not according to the tradition they receive from us, this statement is presenting the result of the previous command. So they were, you're to disassociate Say, disassociate, disassociate yourself from any Christian brother or sister who lives an undisciplined life, they're not working, but being idle. And that undisciplined lifestyle and this discipline is the result of them not living their lives according to the tradition that they receive from Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Now the word paradosis, uh, paradosis, paradosis, the traditions, which appears in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6, also appeared in 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, if you recall. Now, in the latter, uh, the word means the traditions, and it refers to the teachings that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy communicated to the Thessalonians regarding the eschatological day of the Lord while in the presence of these three men and through the contents of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. However, here, this word paradosis, the traditions, refers in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to the command that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy communicated to the Thessalonians, which required that they work for a living and not be idle like those in their culture in the first century AD who were unregenerate. Now, the Thessalonians were taught these traditions when Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were living in their presence and through the contents of first and second Thessalonians. Now, you might say traditions. Oh, I, traditions, there's the word, this word paradosis, it can be used in a negative sense like Mark 7, the traditions of the Pharisees, you know, uh, those things were the, not spirit-inspired traditions. They were not received, they didn't receive them from God. Those are the traditions you got to avoid, okay? Man-made traditions. We go back to what the Spirit says, the teaching of the Scriptures, the commands and prohibitions of Scripture, those are traditions that are good. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about good traditions, the traditions that are based upon what the Spirit says to us in the Scriptures. So, uh, let's close in prayer. But to, before we close in prayer, I just want to wrap up what we've, we've studied here. If you look at uh, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 6 in my translation. Now we command each and every one of you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, based upon His authority, we're commanding you, What's that? To disassociate yourselves from any brother or sister who is living an undisciplined lifestyle. Remember what we said? That's the final stage because Matthew 18, 15 through 17, as we pointed out, after the final stage of church discipline, when it's their sin, the, the guilty party in their sin is presented to the entire church with witnesses to the sin. 
and they refuse to repent, then you disassociate yourself from them. Now, so that would mean Paul's referring to the, the going through the, the, the three stages of church discipline. The fourth stage would be excommunication, as we pointed out. And But then we have to leave open, room open for uh, repentance from them. We should still try to reach out to them from time to time uh, in order that they might repent. Or maybe they'll come to you and or, you know, write you a letter or write whatever or phone call and, uh, and you know, they, they repent it. But you have to have discernment because you have to see uh, you know, the eye, you have to, you have to see it in their lives that they have repented. So if they're a, an alcoholic, uh, in, as we pointed out, one thing would be, uh, they get help. They go to a place where they can get dried out and there's places you can go in, in hospitals. And, uh, I remember when this person, when I was in Iowa, they checked themselves into one of these places in the hospital where you, it's a lockdown thing. You can't get out. And so they put themselves in there because they had fallen off the wagon. So those people, they repent. They don't want to continue to have this problem with alcohol because in the, in the devastating effects of alcoholism and uh, ruining, ruining relationships and whatnot and uh, ruining your reputation and everything, your testimony. So uh, we need, those people, they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to dry out. So that's a, a sign of repentance, okay? But if a person you confront and they don't want to do anything about it, they don't want to stop drinking uh, and they don't want to get help for it uh, if, uh, if they can't quit cold turkey. And I've known some men that have done that. I knew one guy who's very good close friends in Iowa. He was a great part of my ministry and he did. And he told me why. That was after about 10, 15 years of uh, pro- abusing alcohol. He finally did cold turkey. And so some people can do that. A lot of people can't. They need help. And there's nothing wrong with that. At least they're seeking help. That's a sign of repentance. <clears throat> okay? Now, then Paul goes on to say, consequently, they're not living as a result of uh, disasso- uh, not working for a living, living an undisciplined lifestyle, and you having to practice church discipline with these individuals, consequently, this is all a consequence of not living according to the traditions, the teachings of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, which they received from these three men. So uh, on Thursday at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to use this verse, since we've gone through it in detail, we're going to use this verse as a jumping off point to talk about church discipline in a little greater detail. Yes, we've done a study on that, in our series on apostasy, we did a series on church discipline when I was in Marion, Iowa. But I want to go through some principles of church discipline, very important things, on Thursday. And we'll use 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 as a jumping off point because that's talking about, of course, church discipline. So let's close in prayer. Thank you for joining us. Heavenly Father, we pray that this lesson will be a great blessing to the body of Christ, bringing glory to you and your Son, Jesus Christ, ministering to your people and any uh, non-saved that might be in the audience. We thank you for each and every person. We pray again that we will use this class mightily in helping the body of Christ to practice this very important uh, teaching in Scripture to practice church discipline with those who are living ungodly lifestyles and disobedience to your commands and prohibitions of Scripture. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name, we pray.